and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Vienna Connection. Designed by Ignacia Chevchek and Jakob Pachauta, and published by Portal Games, who helped sponsor this video. It's the Cold War era, a time of spies, deadly secrets, and dangers that need to be kept from the general public. You and your team are leading a special covert CIA operation to untangle a web of deception and have truths. Who can you trust? Well, me for one, because I'm going to teach you the rules. Vienna Connection is part of the detective series of games, and while it shares some similarities, it's got a number of differences. If you're curious about how these play, though, you'll find links in the description below. This is a game that is assisted by a website. So to begin, you'll need to go to antariesdatabase.com and create a free account. After logging in, you'll select Vienna Connection and the mission that you want to play. There are four of them, and they must be played in order as they tell an ongoing story, and the decisions you make in one mission will influence what happens in the next. So we'll pick the first mission here. I should point out that for this video, I have an early access version of the website, and over time, as it's updated, some things might change slightly from what you see when you play, but you should have no trouble following along. I should also mention that these missions are packed full of secrets that you uncover as you play, and I'm not going to spoil anything in this video other than what you would normally see within the first few minutes of the first mission. And nothing will be shown that affects important decisions you might need to make. This will be a spoiler-free tutorial. And with that understood, join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, find the mission sheet for the mission that you're playing. We'll be using the one labeled Mission 1, White B, and you put it into your play area. The included pad has two copies of each mission in case you want to replay a mission, and you can download and print even more from the Portal Games website. This is the lead deck, and you'll set that in the play area as well, but don't look through or shuffle it. And nearby, set these various tokens. Next, find and open this package labeled Top Secret. It contains several secret files, which you take out and then set somewhere on the table within reach. And like the lead deck, do not look at or go through these until you're instructed. You'll also find four envelopes labeled as missions from the Central Intelligence Agency. Find the one for your mission and then take out all of its contents. You'll find a bunch of stuff in here. There are three operations which you set on the table with this side face up, but don't look at their other sides. These are three local agents. Set them face up on the table as well. You'll also find an envelope with a code in it, but don't open that up just yet. Most importantly, you'll find a mission setup sheet. Read this side detailing why you've been assigned to the case. I'll leave this for you to read over on your own, but if you look closely, you'll notice this symbol here. Anytime the game shows you this symbol, it means the item you just learned about, in this case, a crashed flight, is something that you'd be familiar with as an agent living in the Cold War era. And you can feel free to research this topic using any resource you have available. Wikipedia, Google, your local library, that giant collection of hardcover books sitting at your grandparents' house that no one's ever touched. Those are encyclopedias, by the way. Your research will not only give you greater insights into the world you're playing in, but might also give you clues to aid in your investigation. Now, once you've read the case introduction, flip the sheet over and learn your team's code name here, your supervisor and their code name, and then follow the additional setup steps. First, it says to add three of the dollar sign tokens to the pool. You separate these from the supply you created earlier, so it's clear that these tokens are the ones you have access to while playing. Now you're told to look at the local agent cards that came in the mission envelope and add their related tokens to your pool. So yellow, blue, and red. Next, it says to open the envelope and collect the code that you find inside. This is something that you'll use later. Then it lists three files. Anytime you see the word files and a three digit number, it's referring to the sheets in your file stack. You now go through these looking only at the numbers in the top left hand corner until you find the required sheets, removing them from the stack. Never look at any of the other files until you're instructed to. So here we just take files 000, 001, and 002. 
Sometimes a single file number will include multiple sheets, which will indicate in its top right-hand corner. For example, file 103 has two sheets. So if the game tells you to collect file 103, you collect both of these at the same time. Any files you're told to collect can be fully examined, and you'll keep them throughout the entire campaign, not just the mission that you're currently playing. In this case, we have a calendar, a map, and a campaign diary. The map and calendar will help us piece together clues in our investigation, while the campaign diary, which is also sometimes referred to as a journal in the game, will be used through all of the missions, and at various times you'll be told to record information in this diary journal. It's best to keep this sheet's spaces available for anything that you're told to record by the game, but also keep pens and papers handy to record your own personal notes as you play. You're going to be untangling a series of mysteries, and you'll find good notes for information and theories you come up with quite helpful. Finally, if we look at the bottom of the mission setup sheet, we'll find the goal of the mission. In this case, to find a connection between a James Werner and a fragment of code that we need to secure. You're also provided with further leads in this area, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But otherwise, that's the setup. In Vienna Connection, you and the other players will be working together to carry out a mission for the CIA. Eventually, your mission will come to an end, and you'll submit your results to the CIA, which influences the plot that unfolds in the next mission. You really can't lose a mission. Your efforts will simply change the course of the campaign. And when the campaign is complete, you'll get an overall assessment to see how you did. Now, while playing, you won't be taking turns. Instead, you decide as a group where you want to gather information from next. And there are four different ways to do this. So let's go over each of them, starting with following a lead. This is your deck of lead cards, and you can never examine it until something you've acquired provides you with further leads. For example, at the beginning of the first mission, this is everything that you have. And you should examine all these materials carefully. But when you're ready, you'll want to pick one of these further leads that are listed here. And there are three of them to choose from. A lead will show a number symbol, then a three-digit number, and indicate the zone that it belongs to. We'll learn about the zones in a moment, but when you pick a lead, you take its matching numbered card from the deck, and you can pick any lead that you have access to. You don't have to do these in any particular order. And this is important because, as you'll see later, you won't have time to follow every lead. So you'll want to discuss as a group which leads seem like they would be the most useful to follow, and only choose those. There are several cards in this deck, and you will not get to see them all. And that's okay, because that's what makes your decisions matter. For this example, let's say we decide to check out the crime scene, which says to check lead 101. I now go through the deck, checking only the numbers in the top left-hand corners. So this way, I don't see any information on any of the other cards. And then I just pull out the one that I'm looking for. Also, make sure you don't flip the card over. You can only examine the front side for now. After withdrawing the lead, first check the zone it belongs to as indicated here. And remember, we were told what zone it would be in the further lead section itself. But now you immediately check the exposure value as listed in this area and cross out that many circles in the matching zone of your mission sheet. So we cross out these two circles in the blue zone in this case. If you're ever required to fill in more spaces than a zone has, it means some of your activities are catching the attention of foreign intelligence agencies. And you'll have to cross the remaining spaces off from the man in black section found here at the bottom. Let's say it was later in the game and we followed another lead that gave us two more exposure in the blue zone. We would cross off this remaining space and then one space from the man in black section. Now, any more exposure we gain in the blue zone will have to be crossed off from this section. As soon as you cross off the last spaces in the man in black area, your mission ends, even if you have open spaces in the other zones. Basically, you've gathered all the information you can, and now it's time to get back to headquarters and submit your findings. So this is why the choices you make will matter. You'll want to follow the leads that don't use up your man in black spaces too quickly. If you have more than two players, this is the final space you can cross off. If you have just one or two players, you get this extra space you can use before the mission ends. And if you have just one player, 
you get this space as well. The extra spaces for lower player counts will help balance out the fact that with fewer players you have fewer minds at the table to help with the investigation. I should also mention that if a lead would require you to cross out more spaces than you have available in the man in black area, that's okay. Just cross out what you can. You still get to follow that lead, but it will be your last one. With that understood, let's learn a little more about what you'll find on leads and how you use them. For this, I will be showing you some of the information on the lead that we drew. Now, this is not going to be much of a spoiler because this is the crime scene lead. I presume this is a lead you'll want to follow. First, you'll read everything here, and if at the end of the lead you see an arrow, it means the lead continues on the other side, and you should flip it over. You'll want to read the leads carefully, because if you see a box like this, it's asking you to answer a question related to something you read on the front side, but you can't flip it over and check now. You must decide on the answer as a group. Then flip the lead over and check to see if you got the answer right. If so, congrats. But if not, mark off a man in black space. Sometimes you'll encounter a code you need to decipher, like this, where you have to look at the numbers provided and deduce a pattern that will help you solve what the X in the code stands for. You'll then fill that X in the required spot. In this case, it will help reveal a new file you can collect from the stack. On the front top left of the file you take, it must show the same card number as the one that led you to it. Don't worry if it doesn't show a letter. You only have to pay attention to the numbers, so this is a correct match. If the number here had been different or it showed no number at all, you didn't crack the code correctly and you'd return that file unseen back to the stack. You can try to crack the code again as many times as you like, but the second time you're wrong, and every time after that, you must cross off a box in the man in black section. If you're having trouble solving a puzzle, you can go to the website and pick the skip the puzzle option to fill in the card that provided the puzzle and tap search. You'll then be given the answer. Speaking of puzzles, sometimes you'll be told that your team has gained a puzzle fragment and it will look like this. Now, this is not a real one, so don't worry, that's not a spoiler, but this is what it will look like. First, notice the symbols and numbers paired with them. Then, in the brackets, you'll see a word with some of the letters filled in. Start by counting how many letters are in that word, including the ones that are just dots. So here, the total is six. In the website, select the puzzle option here, and then tap on these options to cycle through the various puzzles until you find the one that shows a number of circles in this area that matches the number of letters in the puzzle fragment you were given. This has six circles, like the number of our letters, so we stop here. You then fill in the letters you were provided with, and by the related shapes, also fill in the numbers you were given. Then tap save, and if you entered the information correctly, it will let you know. You'll also be told if you made a mistake, and then be instructed to cross out one man in black box. I should point out though, you can make a guess at some of the letters in the puzzle word, even if you haven't been provided with them. If you think you know what the full word might be or some portion of it, fill in as you like, and as long as you have the right letters, you won't get a penalty when you hit save. Now let's look at another type of puzzle you'll encounter, code cards. I'm blurring out some of this for the sake of spoilers, but with what we can see, I can explain how this works. First, the string of words here is known as the password. Check the code card you received in the mission envelope. It also says the same password here, and that lets you know that this card will help you crack the code. Now, check the first number you're provided with. If it shows two digits, the first number represents a row, and the second digit is the column. So this two refers to the row that starts with a two. The three means you go to the column that starts with a three. Where these two lines cross, you'll find the letter they represent, an F in this case. So the next number, 28, means you go to row two again, but this time to column eight, and that will give you an L. If you see a single digit, it represents the column only, so column eight in this case, and you take the letter from the password line itself. So that means this eight represents an I. Next, we have 60. So you go to the row starting with a six, and then the column starting with a zero to get P. You keep going like that until you've solved the entire code, and then you follow its instructions. Sometimes it might provide you with a number and tell you to read that lead 
as we see here. Unlike a further lead, which you can choose to ignore if you want, if you're told to read something, then you must read the related information before moving on. But anything you're required to read will not cause you to cross out spaces on your mission sheet. I should also mention that sometimes the end of a lead will provide further leads, which you can follow later if you wish to. Okay, so we've covered a lot of different things you might discover when following a lead, but I said there were four different options players had when deciding how to gather information. Following leads was one. Another is gaining files, which we've already talked about because we gained some at the beginning of the mission. And we saw that leads can give you even more. Something I didn't mention about files is that they may provide you with recordings and will show this recording symbol here. If so, tap the recordings icon in the website and then enter the file number here. The recording will then be played for you. Another way to gather information is from a search. And guess what? We already learned about that. Remember, searches are when you use outside sources to look up anything marked with this symbol. Well, that leaves us with just one other way to gather information, conducting an operation. You will always be provided with some operation cards and you can perform them at any time during a mission, but they will have a cost. For example, this one has a cost of three. This is how many tokens you must spend to perform the operation. As part of that cost, you must spend the specific tokens shown in the required resources row. Then you can pay any remaining costs from the allowed resources option. So here I'd have to spend a star and a bottle. And the third resource could be either a money, star, or bottle token. Any tokens you spend, you move from the ones you currently own back to the supply. And then after paying the cost, you resolve the effect shown here. And in this case, it says we get to flip over the card and examine the other side of this operation. Even though you get operations at the very start of the mission, you may not want to use them right away, partly because you might want to save your tokens for spending on other things. For example, sometimes a lead, like the one we see here, will require you to spend a token in order to follow it. Also, be aware, not every operation you resolve will end successfully. And with that, we've learned all the different ways you can gather information in the game. And sometimes, as a part of that information, you might see the letters NN. This indicates someone you've learned about, but whose identity remains a mystery. Now, as I mentioned, players will take turns collectively until they cross out the final box in the man in black section of the mission sheet based on their number of players. After that, you can only do things that don't cause more exposure. So you can search, conduct operations, check files you've already revealed, review your notes, and so on. And when you're ready, you move to the end of the mission. To do this, you tap on Final Report here, which takes you through the last two steps. First, you'll be given mission ending information based on any of the word puzzles you solved from those fragments you collected. I can't really show you this as it would give away information that you'll want to discover on your own when you're playing. But once you've collected that new information, you continue to the next step called Further Actions. This is where your team will pick two options from a list of several that I've blurred out. These are the further actions that you're proposing the CIA take as the campaign continues. It represents you guiding the investigation onto its next steps as you prepare for the next mission. There are no wrong answers here. You're not gonna be told, oh, you failed or you succeeded. Instead, you're guiding the next steps that will help provide you with new insights and potentially redirect the plot of the campaign. With your recommendations submitted, the mission is now over and then you're ready and you can continue to the next one. Keep in mind, any lead cards and files you revealed in past missions remain available to you as you progress, but you can't follow a lead from a previous mission during a later one. Operation cards, local agents, your mission sheet, and the code card must be returned to the box and will not be used in future missions. Remember, you do get two mission sheets for each mission, just in case you'd like to replay a mission a second time. To do this, you first arrange the lead cards that you collected back into the deck order and the files back into the stack. You can then reset the campaign here but keep in mind, this will not only reset the current mission, but the entire campaign as well. So use this option carefully. When replaying the game, 
The missions won't change, but you can certainly choose to explore different options and see how the campaign might play out differently. The game also comes with ways to adjust the difficulty level as indicated in this area of the rule book, but I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Vienna Connection. If you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.